a wonderful cross-section of members from the Institute community, current members, former members, faculty, trustees, friends. Uh, and so it's, it's really a great pleasure to welcome you here on the screen. And I hope you understand we had a short delay. I noticed with Zoom, our lives are now run like Swiss trains, but uh, it, uh, it's, it's good to see you. So a happy uh, afternoon, uh, at least here on the on the American East Coast, and, and happy Halloween. Uh, welcome to this public presentation. It marks the October 2020 meeting of our boards of trustees at the Institute for Advanced Study. As you know, I hope I'm Robert Digraf, the director and Lean Levy professor here. And uh, I said we have a very wide audience. I think we counted at least 15 different countries. Um, so uh, it's a delight to have you here. Um, you know, as you know, we are an independent international center, and we feel that you know we um, are uh, try to exemplify the importance of curiosity-driven basic research and scholarship. So I would say uh, our first speaker uh, this afternoon is a quintessential Institute scholar. It's Professor Francesca Trivellato. She's the Andrew W. Mellon Professor in the Institute School of Historical Studies. Uh, Francesca's research intersects many fields, European, Jewish, Mediterranean, Mediterranean and global history, religion and capitalism. Her work has revitalized the study of early economic history and transformed our understanding of the organization and culture of the marketplace in the pre-industrial world. I think her presentation today will borrow from her most recent book, The Promise and Peril of Credit, what a forgotten legend about Jews and finance tells us about the making of European commercial society, which was very well received. It's been awarded, among others, the 2020 Jacques Barzun Prize, Book Prize in Cultural History by the American Philosophical Society. And Francesca will be joined on our virtual dice here for a post presentation discussion with Lorraine Daston. Uh, Lorraine is an IES uh, academic trustee. She's director emerita at the Max Planck Institute for the History of Science in Berlin. Um, but before we uh, commence the presentation, let me tell you a little bit more about these very two very distinguished participants. Uh, Francesca is seen as a leading historian of early and modern history in continental Europe. She the, joined the Institute in uh, faculty in 2018. And before that, she was the Barton and Biggs Professor of History at Yale University, where she was on the faculty for nearly 20 years. She's a graduate of the University of Venice and holds PhDs from both uh, Bocconi University in Milan and Brown University. Uh, I see publishes uh, prof prolifically, in addition to her three widely acclaimed foundational books. Her contributions to the field encompass a staggering number of journal articles, book chapters, co edited volumes, and other scholarly work. She serves on the advisory and editorial boards of many leading publications. And we're very proud of that. She's one of the founders and the editors of a recent new periodical named Capitalism, a journal of history and economics. Her achievements have been recognized at prizes, including the American Historical Association Leo Gershor Award and the Association of Jewish Studies Jordan Snitzer Book Award. She's been a Fulbright Scholar, Fellow at the Radcliffe Institute of Advanced Study uh, at Harvard, the American Council of Learned Societies, the American Academy of Berlin, and the John Simons Guggenheim Memorial Foundation, among others, and held visiting appointments at the Ecole des Hautes Etudes en Sciences Sociales and in Caltech. Now, our second very distinguished guest, uh, Lorraine Daston, is renowned throughout and far beyond the discipline of history of science for many achievements, including building up and co-directing what's widely regarded as the most impressive research centers in that field, the Max Planck Institute for the History of Science in Berlin. Professor Daston has published on a wide range of topics in the history of science, including the history of probability, statistics, of wonders and early modern science, of the emergence of scientific facts, scientific models, objects of scientific inqu inquiry, the moral authority of nature, and the history of scientific objectivity. Her dozen of books include Objectivity, together with Peter Gallison, former academic trustee, Science in the Archives, and most recently, wonderful title, Against Rationality. Uh, Professor Destin's currently at work on a project that she has described as, quote, a history of rules, all of them everywhere, 
uh, a wonderful, ambitious uh, description. Um, her many honors includes the Pfizer Prize and Sartan Medal of the History of Science Society, the Schelling Prize of the Bavarian Academy of Science, Lichtenberg Medal of the Göttingen Academy of Science, the Luhmann Prize of the University of Bielefeld, uh, more recently the Dan David Prize in History of Science and honorary doctorates from among others, Princeton University and Hubie University. She is uh, also a professor in the Committee of Social Thought at the University of Chicago and a permanent fellow of the Wissenschaftskolleg in Berlin, which is our German sister institution. So I couldn't think of two more distinguished scholars to brighten up this Halloween, uh, lovely, actually sunny um, Saturday afternoon here. So thank you both, Francesca and Rainey, for being with us. And with that, I'm very happy to give uh, the word first to Francesca. Thank you, um, Robert, for these very generous words. Thank you, uh, Rainey, for the opportunity of this conversation. Uh, thanks to everyone who has joined from uh, near and very far. And also a very special thanks to the entire Institute staff uh, that goes far and beyond uh, against all the challenges of COVID and helps all of us who are faculty and member here, and we're all extremely grateful. So um, all of you have been uh, thinking and reading, and some of you have been also writing about the rapidly changing economic landscape of the recent past. In this presentation, Professor Dastern and I will take you back to a much earlier time that in many ways is radically different from the present, but in some ways is not so different from the present day. And in order to introduce you to the world that we will inhabit in the next hour, I uh, will use a few graphs. A version of this one has a, a cut on and uh, would lead you to believe that nothing of significance has happened from uh, the first millennium before the Christian era until the English Industrial Revolution of around uh, you know, 1800. However, in uh, matters of graphs, as in other matters, uh, scale make a great difference. So if you uh, zoom into uh, the recent part of this graph, um, say to the period between 1850 and 2000, then you would conclude that uh, A, uh, modern economic growth only begun around 1950, and B, that it coincided uh, with a severe air pollution, a coincidence that destabilizes traditional narratives about progress and prosperity. Conversely, if you zoom into an earlier period, it's hard to say that nothing happened during the pre-industrial period. For example, uh, after the Black Death, severe losses in population led to rises in uh, wages and in real GDP per capita. Now, the three centuries before the Black Death, between around 1000 and 1300, where a period of particular financial creativity in the more advanced and urbanized regions of Europe, among which Northern and Central Italy. Note that uh, the commercial revolution of the Middle Ages preceded the period of artistic and cultural flourishing that we call the Renaissance. And by the end of the commercial revolution of the Middle Ages, two new instruments of private finance emerged. There were also important innovation in public finance, uh, including the public debt. These two uh, innovations were bills of exchange and premium marine insurance. Both of them evolved from pre-existing risk sharing arrangements that uh, had been in use for centuries in both the medieval, in both the Muslim and the Christian medieval uh, Mediterranean, but uh, both of them um, included new features that actually were unprecedented. And Professor Daston will talk about marine insurance 
And I will now tell you about uh, bills of exchange, which were the principal instrument of regional and international payment from around 1300 and through the 19th century. These were uh, materially uh, small pieces of paper, smaller than today's personal checks. They were early forms of cashless payments, as we call them today, and condensed in uh, um, very few coded words, multiple operations. This is um, one of the most legible uh, bills of exchange I chose for you so to make a translation in case we want to walk through it. Um, there are few original copies of bills of exchange that survive in archives because they're very ephemeral uh, documents. This is a chart rendition of this document. Um, and the peculiarity of bills of exchange is that they were financial instruments uh, that uh, accomplished at once a credit and a currency exchange operation. So in a simple term, say you were a merchant, in this case, Mr. Ugolini in the town of Lyon, and you wanted to uh, transfer some funds to Mr. Caponi in Florence, instead of putting some cash, some coins in the back of a horse or on board of a ship, at the risk of them being uh, lost or uh, seized uh, by uh, uh, <clears throat> various accidents, you could go to another merchant banker in the same town and in exchange for a certain amount of money in local currency of Lyon, you would acquire a bill, a piece of paper in the local currency of the town where you wanted the sum to be transferred and you would send it to uh, your agent uh, the actual physical bill uh, in paper and uh, the merchant who issued the bill would give an order to his agent in that town to pay your agent. This was the classic four person bill of exchange. There existed much more uh, complex versions of these bills that were used for financial speculation that had no relation to the sale of actual goods and that prompted uh, usury accusations. Um, but uh, to non-experts, these bills elicited fears connected to their opacity and to the fact that they had uh, no actual intrinsic values. They were simple pieces of paper. And connected to uh, their unscrutability, was the fact that bills of exchange require no collateral. The signature of a merchant stood in place of a pledge. And by the 16th century, there was no actual transfer of coins. Uh, the settlement uh, occurred via simple stroke of pens via account to settlement. Dictionaries from the period took uh, um, stock of these uh, changes uh, in uh, the commercial practice uh, and described uh, loans in the commercial world as extended on the basis of a merchant's reputation for probity and solvency. So without any collateral. The point is that at this time, there was no, there existed no credit scores and there were not even, there existed not even any, you know, trade directories. So the only way to ascertain a merchant's reputation for probity and solvencies was predicated on, you know, networks of relationships. And these networks of relationships uh, depended on the transportation and information technology and on the legal and social structures of the time which leads me to discuss uh, two fundamental features of pre-industrial European societies uh, that constrained the working of pre-industrial finance. Before the invention of the telegraph, information traveled at the same speed 
as humans and animals. This is very hard for us to grasp, um, but that, you know, there were obviously innovation in naval technologies and, you know, but there were no major breakthrough. You still, whether a letter was printed or manuscript, it still had to be transported by an animal or by a human being. There was no systematic way of predicting the incidence of shipwrecks or of piracy. Uh, the timely and uh, accurate uh, arrival, uh, you know, news was very scarce. Uh, precise, accurate news was a very scarce commodity. The printing press uh, of the 15th century made some difference in terms of the uniformity of uh, uh, economic information in local markets but the ability to assess a merchant's credibility remained fundamentally linked to private rather than public information networks. Status hierarchies. This was a world in which there was neither any principle nor any collective aspiration to legal equality before the law. Different individuals and groups possessed different property rights, mostly assigned from birth, depending on their sex, social status, and religious affiliation. Uh, wealth could trump a social hierarchy, but not easily. This meant that a woman, for example, could only sign a bill of exchange if she was the widow of a recognized merchant. It did not happen very often. An aristocrat could certainly um, sign a bill of exchange, but by doing so in countries that had a feudal structure, he would renounce a very coveted privilege of not having to appear before a commoner's court. And that was a privilege that not many aristocrats wish to relinquish. In a number of European cities, Jewish merchants enjoyed um, the same uh, uh, formal uh, rights and privileges as all other merchants within the commercial sphere. But as we will see, there were other ways in which prejudice crept in. So all in all, um, those that today mainstream economists consider market distortions, although in the past couple of decades, many have come to realize they're not such aberrations, were normal conditions in pre-industrial markets. These were the normal standard operation procedures in, in pre-industrial markets, which make, in my view, uh, pre-industrial European markets extremely interesting um, objects of studies. And to give you a, a bit of a flavor, a more concrete flavor of how these uh, structural conditions, uh, um, these uh, uh, everyday market distortions uh, um, affected the ways in which bills of exchange operated. So bills of exchange by the 17th century could be endorsed. So in the case we're looking for, uh, remember Mr. Bogherini was the, the, the merchants to whom the bill was issued to. So once he accepted the bill, um, Mr. Caponi had the choice, he could go Oh, and cash the bill because Bulgarini accepted it, or in theory, he could have uh, endorsed the bill and passed it on to a third party. And in fact, a merchant account, uh, excuse me, merchant's manuals and legal treaties of the time devote several pages to these uh, bills of exchange that have long chains of endorsers uh, that pose great risks because uh, then they can lead to uh, very disruptive bankruptcies. Um, in practice, uh, yes, there were uh, bills of exchange that had a few endorsers, uh, but because all endorsers were liable because of the cost involved in ascertaining the uh, solvencies of all uh, previous endorsers, in reality, it, there are not many bills of exchange that have long chains of endorsers. Um, in practice, uh, 
uh, the majority of bills of exchange circulated among rather limited uh, um, geopolitical uh, borders and uh, social groups. So it's not a coincidence that the examples we're looking at, although in two cities, in Lyon and in Florence, the names of the four parties in the transactions are all from Florentine families that, are, um, that had their own monitoring, uh, you know, social monitoring systems. Um, another example may come from uh, uh, Genoese uh, networks. The Genoese uh, were very important uh, financiers. Um, they had a large footprint all across the Mediterranean and in the 16th and early 17th century became very important financiers of the Spanish crown after uh, Spain uh, uh, conquered uh, uh, larger parts of the Americas, um, but they mostly exchange bills uh, among themselves. Now we have examples uh, of bills uh, traded between uh, uh, merchant bankers who had no social relations among each other. For example, um, Ottoman officials in Istanbul that uh, uh, exchange bills uh, with the French merchants and there were no marital relations for sure uh, between these two groups, but those are exceptions rather than the rule because of the monitoring systems that were necessary. Now bills, uh, excuse me, a business letter of the time are highly formulaic. If we're looking in, bills, in, in business letter to try to understand what motivated the choice of partners with whom and, and, and correspondents with whom to build these uh, networks uh, of uh, financial cooperations. These business letters are highly formulaic because they were legal documents. But occasionally a comment to surface here and there and uh, gives us the uh, sense of the apprehension with which uh, the, you know, one ventured beyond one community. Uh, this is just uh, uh, one example of two English merchants trading between Izmir and London, and you can read it for yourself. Uh, this is um, the sort of comment that today we would, uh, you know, give us a chill because of the sheer prejudice that it involves. And at the time, it certainly was that, but it was also the measure of the information technology and the social segmentation that made an individual merchant's reputation inseparable from the moral judgment and the exclusionary logic of group belonging. So the larger point here is that the flourishing of the paper economy under these conditions engendered fears of oligopolies and created a fertile ground for conspiracy theories. And the most enduring of these conspiracy theories was ludicrous, but also ubiquitous. In 1647, a lawyer in Bordeaux committed to the printed page a once widely read comment of a once widely read commentary on maritime law, the idea that medieval Jews invented both marine insurance and bills of exchange. And I don't need to tell you that this idea had no grounds whatsoever, but I do need to tell you that this idea remained a staple of European economic thought through the early 20th century what I've been calling the legend of the Jewish invention of marine insurance and bills of exchange was not meant to condemn all credit, but rather to provide a narrative, misguided as it was, to distinguish between reputable and disreputable credit at a time when for many reasons, it had become increasingly difficult to do so. Not only did Christians regard Jews as theologically and economically untrustworthy, but in the 17th centuries, the boundaries between Jews and Christians were blurring. Jews were becoming invisible, just as bills of exchange were infiltrating all corners of life. In Bordeaux, in the south of France, where the legend was first published, 
Jews fleeing the Iberian Inquisitions were only allowed to live as Portuguese merchants, that is, as baptized Catholics, and yet the sincerity of their Catholicism was constantly doubted. In other parts of Europe, notably in Venice and in Amsterdam, they could live as Jews, but the most affluent among them took on the attires of their Christian peers and became outwardly invisible. Jumping ahead, it's worth remembering that only in the 1950s did Adam Smith's invisible hand become the go-to metaphor for competitive markets and free trade, thanks to a widely popular undergraduate economics textbooks by Nobel laureate Paul Samuelson. These were the 1950s of affluent society and the cosmic, the cosmic curve. But for the preceding three centuries, the invisibility of Jews, not the invisible hand, had been the preferred theme in European commercial literature and had carried with it a much darker message. The failure of regulatory authorities to uproot speculation and predatory lending had made room for an insidious legend to nurture the illusion that by freeing it from the so-called Jewish, that is bad interference, the financial world would automatically become well-tempered and self-sustaining. To conclude, innovation in private finance in pre-industrial Europe broadened social participation in commercial ventures and certainly improved the lives of many, but it also accentuated the distance between insiders and outsiders. In both practice and theory, commerce did not pave the way for inclusive attitudes. Yesterday, like today, the divorce between the paper economy and the real economy generated a cultural backlash. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Francesca. I think now we would like to uh, give the floor to the screen to Lorraine to give your commands. Hey. Um, I, I'd like to echo uh, Francesca's thanks to Robert, the Institute, and to all of you who chose to spend your Halloween evening not trick-or-treating or even with Netflix, but with us. <laughs> um, I'll start with an allegorical painting um, this is an allegory of fortune, which is painted in 1530 in exactly the northern Italian milieu, in this case, the court at Ferrara, um, that Francesca has just conjured up for us so vividly. It's an age of an explosion of financial creativity and also of historical myth-making. And what you see here is on the right, a female figure who represents fortune, her cornucopia shows you all of the good things she is capable of dispensing, but note that she is perched very precariously on a bubble that might burst at any moment and that she's missing a sandal, suggesting that she could just as easily deprive you of everything you own. She's as fickle as her golden scarf, which is being tossed by the wind. Um, the figure on the left is a male figure who represents chance. And in light of what Francesca has just told us, it's tempting to interpret the slips of paper which he's clutching in his right hand as bills of exchange. But in fact, they are probably, given the urn also at his right, lottery tickets. Lotteries had become by the early 16th century an extremely popular way for Italian governments to raise money without imposing taxes. For my purposes, these two figures stand for a fundamental distinction in economic theory that was first made by the economist Frank Knight about 100 years ago in 1921 between uncertainty and risk. And I'm not going to read the quotation, but the distinction is basically between risk, which is measurable, versus uncertainty, which is radical which we can't quantify. And in, I think, the year 2020, I don't need to belabor 
the difference between a risk that you can calculate and therefore, as Knight pointed out, um, take into account as part of the costs of doing business versus the radical uncertainty that might pounce upon you unawares um, at any moment. If we go back to this allegorical painting, um, chance now stands for risk, for measurable uncertainty. Um, the lottery slips that he's clutching in his right hand um, are measurable. They, we could calculate their probabilities in a fair lottery, even if most people who play the lottery don't, whereas fortune stands for radical uncertainty. And what I'd like to talk about is maritime insurance, which was a world in which the boundary between measurable risk and unmeasurable uncertainty is blurred and where the kinds of risks of losing your sandal or losing your shirt were all too real in the late medieval and early modern period. So nowhere in late medieval and early modern commerce did uncertainty play a more central role than in shipping merchandise over long distances. And it's therefore not surprising that Rembrandt in this etching has combined the motifs of Fortuna, here she is at the mast, and instead of her scarf being tossed to the wind, she has now sails and a ship which is setting sail for some foreign port. Um, by the early 16th century, goods are regularly flowing by maritime routes from Europe to Asia, the Americas, Africa, um, and parts of other parts of Europe. Um, and even before, as Francesca has already shown us, products such as silk, furs, wool, wine, spices, tin, and much, much else were being shipped by river and by sea within Europe. Now, the water routes are generally quicker, cheaper, and safer than overland transportation, but they're still quite hazardous. Storms, pirates, port robbery, and just plain old bad seamanship could endanger and did endanger many a shipment. Um, the obvious solution to this was some form of maritime insurance. Now, some kind of arrangement, very different kinds of arrangements, had been known since at least Roman times, perhaps even by Phoenician times. And as Francesca has already mentioned, um, it was widely practiced in one form or another in both the Islamic and Christian world in the Middle Ages. What we see, again, in that febrile inventive financial world that she's just described of the late Middle Ages and the early modern period is the rise of premium insurance. And you can pretty much track the migration of the commercial centers of Europe by the dates at which these cities begin to promulgate um, codes of regulations about maritime insurance. Now, these premiums had to be priced somehow. And if we were in the modern period, we would, of course, say the right way to do this is by statistics. And it would have been seen by Knight, for example, as an absolutely paradigmatic example of risk, of measurable uncertainty. Um, but in the case of maritime insurance as it's practiced in the late medieval and early modern period, statistics are all but unknown. And my question is, why was this the case? Um, and I think it's important here to keep in mind the inventive, ingenious world of early modern European finance that Francesca has just conjured for us. This is a world of highly numerate, feverishly innovative cosmopolitan traders who are at home in markets and ports all over Europe and beyond. And as their use and occasional abuse of bills of exchange testifies, they are shrewd, sophisticated calculators who exploited even slim profits um, to the hilt. Moreover, as maritime insurers, they had firsthand access to the information they would have needed to compile statistics. After all, they were the people who were going to have to pay damages if a ship did not return safely to port. So the mystery here only deepens. Why didn't they keep and use statistics 
in order to price their premiums? The answer I think lies in two assumptions that underlie all successful applications of statistics. First, the existence of what are called homogeneous reference classes has to be assumed and they have to be discerned. So how should you divide up ships and their cargoes into risk classes? Should you do it by the age of the ship, the experience of the captain and the crew, the value of the cargo that you're insuring, the length of the route, the season of the year, the likelihood of a nasty encounter en route with pirates or a hostile warship, or perhaps the presence of plague in your port of call. All of these factors and all combinations of these factors were relevant to pricing premium insurance in the early modern period. Um, and we know from the surviving records and from those regulations that early modern maritime insurers paid keen attention to all of these factors and they priced their premiums accordingly. So we know that, for example, um, a seaworthy ship en route from Genoa to Cyprus, one of those routes that Francesca showed us, with a cargo that I say of wheat and wine, might be in a low risk category with a premium of 5% of the value of the cargo one week, but in the next week in a high risk category with a premium about 19% or so. So in a volatile world of belated, remember how slowly information travels and at best imperfect information, the existence of these homogeneous reference classes cannot be safely assumed. The second assumption is stability over time. Even if you can assume homogeneous reference classes, it might be treacherous to depend on averages based on too short a time scale. This, unfortunately, is a truth which has come home to haunt us recently. Um, in the midst of a current pandemic, we know that the number of intensive care beds in Milan or New York City might be adequate for average circumstances, but suddenly, without warning, become woefully inadequate in the time of a pandemic. So let me just show you um, two graphics that I think you should just keep in mind as emblems of these two problems. Um, the first, I have to admit, um, the range here of premiums is accurate. For that, we have information. Um, the specific figures about the rise is my invention for the very same reason that it's very difficult to come by statistics um, for this period. And you see that um, a ship, the very same ship, um, on the same route with the same cargo might be charged a 5% premium in March. But if news of pirates reaches the port of embarkation, that might suddenly leap up to almost 15% and then decline again when the pirates have decided to ply their trade elsewhere along a different risk. If we look instead at this figure of mortality data in New York City, you see the difficulty of assuming, even if you have um, stable reference classes, the difficulty of assuming stability over time. Um, with two notable exceptions, mortality rates in New York City are quite predictable. Even the variations within a year are quite predictable, as you see from the shape of um, the peaks and troughs. But suddenly, without warning, that temporal stability can be disrupted as it was in September of 2001, and even more dramatically in April of this year. So we are talking about a world in which um, insurers are at the mercy of whatever information they might receive. And as Francesca has already told us, that information might be filtered by their social class, networks of trust, and legal structures. I show you here Lloyd's Coffee House in 1789 because all of this begins to change around the 1760s. In 1764, for the very first time, 
Lloyd's of London, which began as a coffee house, which was founded in 1686 for the exchange of this kind of information, begins to publish a register of shipping in which for the very first time, stable reference classes for ships are defined, as well as statistics of shipwrecks and accidents compiled for all of the routes which Lloyd's um, insures. Not coincidentally, the first statistically based life insurance um, offered by the Society for Equitable Insurance on Lives and Survivorships is established two years previously in 1762. This is particularly frustrating, I think, for mathematicians since the late 17th century, since the invention of probability theory in the 1650s, they had been trying to persuade their governments who regularly raised money by the sale of annuities, which is a sort of inverse life insurance, that it would be a really good idea to take account of the age of the annuitant in pricing the annuity. Unfortunately, the policy of most governments was to offer the same price to a youth of seven as a dotard of 70. Not until the 1760s do statistics become relevant for the pricing of annuities and life insurance. So what changes? Um, the answer here in contrast to the situation of a port in say late medieval Hamburg where you see all of the merchants and the insurers exchanging information, the latest good and bad news of the pro at the port. The answer here lies in the creation of certain pockets of stability in the course of the 18th century. I use Amsterdam not only as a typical example, but also as the poster child of these changes. By the late 17th century, Amsterdam had succeeded in illuminating its streets at night, greatly reducing the crime rate, in establishing a fire department with ready water pumps, in clearing away human and animal filth from its streets and um, canals, um, in prohibiting firearms for the most part, and in generally regulating almost every detail of urban life. It was much admired and envied by other metropolises. Paris and London often followed Amsterdam innovations to the letter. These cities were also, of course, the commercial centers of Europe during this period. And it, the experience of living in these pockets of orderliness may have persuaded their residents, including the buyers and sellers of insurance, that at least certain parts of the world were orderly enough to become safe for statistics, to follow those two assumptions of homogeneous reference classes and stability over time. But, and this will be my last point, we must always bear in mind that this experience of increased order, predictability and security held for only a small privileged portion of even the best regulated 18th century metropolises. The life of the poor remained as subject to the vicissitudes of the goddess Fortuna as ever. Um, in medieval depictions of Fortuna, everyone is at the mercy of the turn of her wheel, whether you are a king or a beggar, and she's blindfolded because she does exercise a certain brutal justice. But if we look at this depiction of Fortuna from the early 18th century, we see that she is now reliably distributing her boons to the well-off part of the population on the left side of the painting. You see cardinal's hats, papal tiaras, bags of money being showered upon the gentry in their periwigs and velvet greatcoats. And on the right side of the picture, she is just as predictably dispensing her brickbats, um, manacles, gallows, plague, the implements of hard labor, the hoe and the rake to the poorer part 
of the population. She had become indeed more predictable, but also more unjust. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Rainey and, and Francesca. I'm, on behalf of all of us, I'm applauding you. And, um, and I think we have some time for questions and answers. Um, so I want to invite everyone to either raise your hand digitally, if you know how to do that, on Zoom, or use the chat function to ask a question. And when you're, while you're gathering your minds, I want to start with asking both, both of you, and thank you for these absolutely delightful presentations in a time of much, uh, I would say, uncertainty uh, in general, uh, to, to, br to bring us back to these to these historicals, also analogies and metaphors, undoubtedly, in the minds of many of us. I had a question to both of you, to which extent the practitioners of these new methods uh, were actually reflecting on what they were doing and were communicating about this. I have to think about, you, you mentioned the life annuities, uh, Lorraine. I know when they were introduced in the 17th century in the Netherlands, the the prime minister at the time, uh, Johan de Witt, actually wrote a book about this, uh, yes. explaining to the public at large yes. uh, uh, the concept of probability. And I must say, I always felt it curious that then the proceeds of these annuities were used to start a war with England, vastly changing the chances and probabilities, I would say. But so, to what extent was, was there a, a reflection on the technology behind this? Perhaps to both of you, perhaps, Lorraine, you can start and then Francesca. Yes, so the example of De Witt is extremely interesting and enormously frustrating for the mathematicians of the period. Um, Robert, please close your ears. I'm going about to murder the Dutch pronunciation. Um, but he's in correspondence with um, Johan Hude, yes. who is providing him with what mortality data exists in the late 17th century. And had De Witt not been murdered by an angry crowd, um, we might have hoped that the Netherlands might have indeed created the first mathematically based um, insurance. The mathematicians starting with Huygens, Leibniz, Bernoulli, de Moivre um, are all pleading with their governments to use statistics and probability. It has no effect whatsoever um, until the 1760s. Um, I think it's in part because the world, frankly, isn't yet safe for statistics, or at least nobody believes that it's yet safe for statistics. Um, and that, I think, is the great puzzle, which is what kind of world do you have to have in order for statistics to be a safe method for turning radical uncertainty into measurable risk? Francesca, particularly also interested, you know, what happened in the Italian Renaissance, you know, which uh, you could imagine, you know, there were a lot of mathematicians interested in this. There, there was great uh, self-reflection for sure. I, I would add a different dimension perhaps to, to your question that um, you know, there's a thin line between uh, uh, pride and uh, public disclosure of the mystery of the exchange and uh, the need to keep the mystery of the exchange uh, private and secret. Um, so did merchants learn how to do these intricate operation from the printed manuals? Maybe not. And uh, you know, how was this uh, know-how transferred? Um, you know, was uh, um, if you read, uh, you know, so, the, so there, there's also competition, different, uh, different countries, uh, there weren't really countries, but there's a certain uh, proto-national uh, ambition to claim the origins of these instruments uh, for oneself. Um, but there's a, there's a great debate among historians about which difference did the printing press made in terms of the diffusion of this information and uh, which, uh, which uh, information circulated uh, um, more privately uh, because of the need to keep the secret um, of these very intricate, uh, 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 but there, there's begin to be a lot of questions. Uh, I don't want to go on too long because I see that the chat function is, the chat filling, is up. filling up. The chat is <laughs> filling that's up. Your, that's your task, Robert. That's my task. So I start mm -hmm. with the question from the Baris Sulovitz. How did the insurance price insurance before the 18th century? 
So I guess that's for me. Um, yes, I guess so. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Um, so they they price it by a minute to minute monitoring of all of the information they can gather about the relevant factors. So if you were, for example, um, a maritime insurer in Hamburg or in Genoa, you would be at the port, you would interview the captain personally, you would inspect the ship and its rigging, especially its hull. Um, you would look at the cargo to make sure that it was as valuable as um, the merchant claimed it was. And you would be, if not in a coffee house like Lloyd's um, in the late 17th and 18th century, you would have been listening to every possible rumor of conditions along the route. Um, that meant that the premiums could vary with extraordinary volatility from day to day because the conditions were changing, the relevant conditions were changing from day to day. So um, the premiums obviously carried a price, they were quantified, but they were not quantified statistically. Thank you. Uh, I'm going rapidly through the questions. Uh, we'll, we have some uh, will be asked in a moment, but uh, a question from Jeff Doomland is COVID and its unequal effects eliminating the instability of current homogeneous references classes. And does economic history offer any lessons for working with these instabilities? I guess that's the question any historian dread, what the lessons are for the present. Francesca, do you want to, to start or should I? Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> Okay, so um, I do think that um, every pandemic upsets our notion of what a homogeneous reference class is. So there was an article published last week in Nature by one of my colleagues at the Max Planck Gesellschaft um, about, by Svante Pebo and his group in Leipzig, about the fact that there seems to be a certain group of genes, in part from the Neanderthal inheritance, um, which are correlated with high risk of respiratory failure um, in patients who are unfortunate enough to contract COVID-19. Um, so we have here a new reference class. We don't know yet know how homogeneous it is and how stable it is. Um, but yes, every, every new disease creates a new set of reference classes. And one of the both terrifying but also exciting things about the moment we are living in now is how very quickly new reference classes are crystallizing as more information is made available about the course of the disease. Thank you. Uh, a question from Ian jo Jocelyn. Since bills of exchange could be exchanged, would they be used as money and did they contribute significantly to inflation? If so, how did the political powers react to this? Perhaps a question for you, uh, Francesca. Yeah, this is an interesting question. So. Technically, uh, bills of exchange were not money because they were not backed by a sovereign uh, institution. They were not, you know, never fiat money, uh, but they were occasionally called uh, money by observers because there was this perception that they circulated so easily. They were a, a private, you know, they were just based on the private reputation of those that exchanged them. They could be used, I mean, they were used, you know, at the time, a lot of taxes were usually raised by financiers who were, uh, who paid the taxes in advance to the king uh, and then were, went out and raised money from those uh, which were not nobles because nobles normally didn't pay taxes, uh, but uh, were used uh, and they could have a relationship to uh, public finance in the sense that the value of currency exchange depended on bullion reserve of different states. But it's very important that they were not uh, money in the way in which modern finance des describes money, and they were an instrument of private finance, but in the, in the public perception, they could be seen as money precisely because how easily they could circulate and this perception should matter to us as historians because in credit matters it's hard to separate the reality from the perception. Thank you. A uh, question from Esther Dyson and uh, thank you Esther for joining us. I think this is for you Lorraine. Uh, 
Uh, how much did insurance buyers take measures to lower the risk and therefore the prices they paid? They certainly took um, as many measures as they could. Um, and perhaps, once again, to return to Francesco's point about perception, perhaps the most important precaution they took was to ensure the reputation of the captain by any means possible. <laughs> so it's a question, first of all, of the captain's competence, but also of the captain's honesty. Um, it was not unknown then as now for the captain to skim off certain parts of the cargo and sell them on the side for profit claiming an accident afterwards. Um, I think it's also important to bear in mind that for the insurers, depending on how competitive the insurance market was, all that was necessary was to charge enough to make a profit. And this is also the case, by the way, for lotteries. Lottery tickets, the price of lottery tickets bore absolutely no relationship to a, what we would consider a fair price. Um, mm. It's basically what the market will bear. And the market has to bear enough so that you can take at least reasonable risk and still clear a profit. Thank you. Uh, I know Nina, Nina Dubin, you have your uh, hand raised. Can you, can you ask your question? Yes, sorry, I started to put it in the chat, but I couldn't focus on the answers. And so I just didn't want to have to do two things at once. So sorry to disrupt. I just had a, a question for Francesca. Um, thank you both so much for your wonderful talks. And my question has to do with the nature of the uncertainty that you were describing. And I just wondered if you have come across in your research anything to do with that uncertainty being a question in part of a kind of uncertainty about paper itself, which has this, which is really considered to be a very mysterious object in the early modern period. Its, its origins are unknown. Um, there's speculation about where this material comes from, and especially even beyond, even as bills of exchange begin to circulate in ever greater numbers. And then once they, once paper starts getting printed in the form of currency um, during the Mississippi bubble, I'm just wondering if you've come across anything having to do with an uncertainty that has to do with an, an awareness of potentially dwindling resources upon which the bank you know, can draw when it's just actually putting paper money into circulation. So it's Thank a kind you. of environmental or ecological question. Well, I know that there's, you know, that it's often written by historians that there's the scarcity of paper, but I haven't actually encountered it. I mean, you know, it, 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 by the late Middle Ages, the paper is no longer a Chinese product. It's, be, it's become a European product. It's actually the town of Fabriano in central Italy becomes the, the central, pro, uh, you know, pr producer of paper. And uh, as you know, these, um, I, I, I could have pointed out, on the bills, it says whether it is the first or the second or the third bills as letters, bills are, are sent in multiple copies because it is in the same way as, as any cargo, they can get lost. And so you wanna make sure that nobody cashes the same bill more than once, um, uh, but they are sent in multiple copies. The anxiety is more about the possibility that the actual piece of paper that not reaches its uh, uh, destination because it does travel with any, you know, together with any other, um, you know, item that has to be insured. <laughs> so it's, it's the peril of the travel. Um, but I have not encountered, uh, um, uh, a consi you know, any, any particular uh, concern with the actual materiality. It's more about the immateriality of the fact that uh, there is no intrinsic value and that you know the paper economy is something very new. I mean, there in the Middle Ages, there's a lot of concern for um, the clipping of coins, which is another uh, typical crime that is associated with Jews um, and with uh, with a declining uh, uh, intrinsic value of, uh, of uh, intrinsic bullion value of coins. But I haven't encountered that particular doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It may not be in the kind of records that I have been reading. I, I think I want to combine two questions. Uh, one very, uh, from Chaib Khan, who says, Marx famously stated that credit is the economic judgment on the morality of man. Does the prevalence of the modern credit score signals a continuity with the 16th century emphasis on reputation and solvency as grounds for receiving credit? And then I want to combine that also with the question of Björn, 
Wendlager, who says, was the reputation of solvency influenced by other non-financial aspects besides being Greek? And how did religion, moral, uh, piety, and others play a role? So I think perhaps for both of you, but... Uh, I think Francesca, this is for Francesca. Sorry? Francesca, yes, you want to start? I'm happy to take this. So um, credit scores originated uh, in um, the middle of the 19th century in the United States. Um, and in their earliest, they were uh, developed by a private firm as a, as a private commodity that was then sold to subscriber. And in their, uh, before they became numbers, they were um, <clears throat> verbal description of very moral qualities. Um, so the earliest uh, credit scores more or less would say, you know, he goes to church on Sunday, he dresses okay, doesn't seem to drink too much, uh, doesn't beat his wife. Uh, I'm exaggerating, but not too much. Uh, and then there's a slow evolution during the second half of the 19th century when these uh, uh, <clears throat> moral characteristics are converted into numbers. And uh, um, I don't, you know, I am really cautious in commenting any contemporary phenomena because other than reading newspaper, I don't have any uh, deep knowledge, but I have been uh, really um, surprised and, 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 and fascinated by the rise of these uh, um, social uh, credit scores in China uh, in which uh, the um, behaviors to which uh, you know, scores are being attributed are really reminiscent of the kind of social policing that was done in the early modern period. Um, and so I don't wanna draw uh, too quick a conclusion because that will be facile, um, but it is uh, really, you know, of the forms of discrimination in the mortgage markets that exist in the United States that have been amply documented by investigative journalism. Uh, the kind of reporting about the China uh, social uh, uh, scores about everyday behavior. Uh, these phenomena for any of us, uh, 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 Rainy Daston has written a, a beautiful short piece in, in, in Critical Inquiry about any of us who has been living in this pre-modern reality and wakes up and, and read the papers today and find uh, so many echoes. Um, and uh, I mean, the, it, it's a sad vindication for those of us who never fully believed that modernity was around the corner. I mean, there's aspect of modernity that I would be very happy to embrace, to be honest. I, I'm not a nostalgic uh, uh, of the pre-modern economy. I personally would not be among those who would be particularly uh, among the winners in that world. So, um, but there's certainly, I think there is a, a sensitivity that we have to, to have. Um, and uh, not, a, not a very happy sensitivity, uh, but certainly in that, in that respect, uh, uh, we want to learn from, uh, from, uh, uh, from uh, you know, to, 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 to the, that, that kind of uh, um, hope we had to have left that world behind. A very famous British historian called it uh, the world we, you know, that we've lost. We actually have not lost that world, uh, not for the better anyway. Thank you. I, I, I want to slowly bring the discussion to an end. Uh, we, we can't cover all the questions, but perhaps a, a last question. And I think both of you can can take your answer. And just you already started to reflect on this. It's a question by Li Kung Wang, who says, it seems Fortuna favors those with privileged access to information. Would today's digital technologies bring more imbalance or less? And, and there was also a question uh, which I like very much that uh, Paul Volcker apparently said that the ATM was the biggest recent invention in banking uh, technology. Uh, uh, are there other technological breakthroughs that are either pushing this in one or the other direction? So I know though you love to live in the early modern period, I'll, I'm just provoking you once more to uh, look with your knowledgeable historical eye to the present and say something. Uh, 
Rainy a, a venture start. where angels and historians fear to tread, namely <laughs> right now, um, which is, I think that the analogy with the internet is so interesting and thought provoking if you are a historian of the early modern period, which is, of course, the first thing we think about when we think about the internet is the fact that it's larded with disinformation and of the difficulty of distinguishing, um, as it were, true metal from forgeries. And that I think is an extremely important thought to bear in mind also about the late medieval and early modern information market. It too was filled with partial information and deliberate disinformation. Those, those merchants that um, you saw briefly in Lloyd's Coffee House were not necessarily telling each other uh, the truth or the whole truth or even part of the truth um, of what they knew. They were in a competitive situation um, playing a high stakes game of both reputation but also of profit. So I think the analogy is a very good one and a very revealing one. Francesca, you want to say something to this? Well, that, that you know, that um, I, it's, it's an excellent point uh, uh, on which uh, to conclude there was, uh, as a colleague of ours wrote a book, you know, there was information overload uh, in the early modern period uh, and, uh, you know, the, the, how, to, how to discern. And there was, you know, as I, as I noted, um, information asymmetry was a, a defining feature of these markets. Uh, these were clubs uh, who could enter in the, there was a question about uh, the markets where the bills of exchange was traded. No, they were not public. You had to be a member of a club. And we have discovered that finance is very clubbish in our, in our world in which in theory, everybody from their iPhone, from their smartphone could trade in the stock market, but the kind of information you need in order to make sure that your, uh, you know, that your, uh, the savings you have to live uh, after you retire will be healthy enough requires enormous level of knowledge and intermediation. So the technology itself allows every citizen to be, uh, uh, you know, empowered to, um, uh, to, to uh, do what, uh, you know, in theory, they could uh, build their savings, but it doesn't mean that uh, uh, to be able to click a button ensures that then everybody can uh, 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 grow their savings. And that uh, is uh, a very, very, very crucial point at the the illusion that everybody can have uh, the same access to information just because uh, there is a technological ability to access that information. It is uh, one, I think, of the most, uh, uh, I mean, the word dangerous may be, you know, alarmist, but I think it actually is correct because uh, uh, we live uh, in a very pyramidal and very asymmetrical world in terms of who has a, uh, uh, access to the most precious information and the rest of the population. Well, thank you both, you know, both for this wonderful presentation and the uh, elegance uh, which you uh, answered this uh, scattershot of, of questions. Uh, as you said, you know, uh, particularly in the modern day, digital technology can be used for the spread of disinformation, but at least for this hour, I think we counted it, but the spread of uh, wonderful uh, scholarship that, uh, and uh, it's the fact that we have uh, at some point almost 200 people here uh, on the various pages of my uh, Zoom screen was uh, very uplifting. So I want to thank both of you, Lorraine and Francesca, for giving this lecture. Uh, I'm applauding you on behalf of all those of are muted. And uh, I want to thank all of you for joining this session and uh, wish you a wonderful weekend. In particular, I wanted to thank uh, the trustees that were part of this. I know they had uh, a day and a half of Zoom meetings, but I think this at least ended on a high note. So thank you all for joining. And again, warm thanks for our, both our speakers. <laughs>